Good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Ross. I'm one of the national board members for Wild Ones, and I'm also the director of continuing education at Longwood Gardens. We're really excited to welcome you all to hear Heather Holmes' presentation on wasps. I know many of you last year saw her amazing presentation to Bombas Among Us all about bees, and we're changing gears just a little bit and looking at their nearby cousins, the wasps. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We know that we have uh, people joining us from all across the United States. I wanted to remind all of you that you are muted and your video is off for today's presentation. And then we're going to be beginning promptly in just about a minute. So sit back, relax, grab a nice glass of water or coffee or tea um, and get ready for a thrilling webinar. This is part of our honorary directors webinar series. And uh, for those of you that have missed out on those in the past, they are on our YouTube channel. So definitely check them out. This is an initiative that we've been doing for a little while now at, at Wild Ones. And we're really, really excited to bring back Heather after she wowed us about bees. I know that you're all going to get a lot of great insight into the world of wasps. We're going to begin right now. So good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us. On behalf of Executive Director Jen Ainsworth, the National Wildlife, or sorry, the National Wild Ones staff in Wisconsin, our honorary directors, and the Wild Ones Board of Directors, we're excited to welcome you to tonight's seminar. I'm Matthew Ross, I'm your host for this evening. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we're a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. We have 73 chapters in 21 states, and if there's not a chapter in your state, please think about starting one. Tonight's presentation will feature Heather Holm, award-winning author, biologist, pollinator, pollinator conservationist, and Wild Ones honorary director. Heather also serves on the board of the Friends of Cullen Nature Preserve and Bird Sanctuary. She's an active community supporter working on projects, writing grants, and coordinating neighborhood projects, including restoring city-owned parkland and our Minnesota neighborhood for both pollinators and people alike. Furthermore, Heather has authored several books, including Pollinators of Native Bees, which you see right behind me, Bees, which has won six book awards, and Heather's expertise includes interactions between native pollinators and native plants, the natural history and biology of native bees and predatory wasps occurring in the upper Midwest and the Northeast. Tonight, Heather will share with us her new book, Wasps, Their Biology, Diversity, and Role as Beneficial Insects and Pollinators of Native Plants. Be prepared to be engaged and inspired with the 150 varied species of flower visiting wasps present in Eastern North America and the specific native plants and habitat each spe species depends on. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. This presentation will be recorded for your review and to share with friends and family and other Wild Ones members. We have a series of questions that were submitted prior to this evening's event, and those questions will be answered throughout the duration of the presentation or at the end if time allows. I'm sure that you're excited and I know I am as well. So now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to our presenter tonight, Wild Ones Honorary Director, Heather Holm. Thank you, Heather, and let's begin. Thanks, Matthew. It's great to be here and to be an honor honorary director of Wild Ones. Um, I also am a board member of my local chapter. And as Matthew said, anybody can start a Wild Ones chapter. We started a spin-off seedling chapter from our large um, Twin, Twin Cities, Minnesota chapter many years ago. And so the more chapters, the better we can get the word out about the benefits of landscaping with native plants. And uh, thank you for tuning in to hear about wasps this evening. I started writing that book about three and a half years ago and I never imagined I'd be presenting about probably everybody's least fa favorite insect to hundreds of people. So I really appreciate your curiosity, fascination, and maybe you're just already completely into wasps. So hopefully I can change some minds tonight as well because Matthew and I were talking before uh, the ad attendees joined and a lot of people have, you know, really bad memories of getting stung by wasps. So I'm going to try and address and sort of parse out uh, wasp diversity, give you an idea of um, the different groups of wasps, the ones that you may get stung by, but I also really want to highlight many of the wasps that are out 
in the landscape, doing their thing, building their nest, hunting their prey. And they have a solitary lifestyle. So they're not having any negative interactions with us while we're gardening or out for a hike. So I really want to try and open your eyes to this amazing diversity of this group of insects. I'm going to touch briefly on their classification just to give you a sense of how many species occur in North America, North of Mexico, and then of course tie in their important relationship with plants. So I'll be talking about some of the native plant preferences that wasps uh, visit, uh, what kind of prey they hunt, and then why we consider them beneficial insects. They're providing not only some pollination services, but they're hunting um, various types of insects, helping to keep pest population insects in control. So with that, let's get started to talk about wasp classification. Wasps belong to the same order as bees and ants, sawflies, horntails, the order Hymenoptera. And the high order Hymenoptera is broken down into two suborders, the suborder Symphyta, which includes sawflies and horntails, and then the other very large suborder or species rich suborder, uh, Apocrita. Now the suborder Symphyta, the sawflies and horntails, these are some of the most primitive wasps. So you can see some examples on the bottom photos, uh, the adult, adult horntail, adult sawflies, they're, they're sort of called wasteless wasps because they lack that typical really constricted white waste that we associate with other kinds of wasps. And the other thing to mention is they are plant feeding. So the horntail larva, for example, feed on uh, decaying wood and sawfly larva look rather caterpillar-like and often feed gregariously uh, consuming plant leaves. So they can often be mistaken for uh, butterfly or moth larva. But I'm going to be focusing on, of course, this other suborder, which includes the wasps. And as you can see, that is further broken down into two sort of major groups. The, the parasitic wasp, which I'll mention, but not really cover so much this evening. Very diverse group, uh, close to 9,500 species in North America, North of Mexico. And I just wanna mention the numbers that I have on this slide are approximate and quite old. This, the entire order Hymenopter really hasn't been updated for uh, decades. So don't, don't email me after and say, your numbers are way off <laughs> because that's very likely the case, but this is, this is the current information that we have. So what are the parasitic wasps? Well, they are the wasps that are uh, really don't build a nest. So this is an example of one of our very large parasitic species, the giant ichneumon wasp. And you can see that female, she has a very long stinger-like apparatus, which is her ovipositor. And so really the, the primary difference between the parasitic wasps and the wasps in the other group, the aculeata that I'll be talking about tonight, um, these wasps do not build a nest. So they are out seeking, uh, looking for their prey. The females find their prey and they drill into perhaps the substrate where their prey is, such as in this example, uh, the female is drilling through the side of a dead tree to lay her egg into a horntail larva. And so that ovipositor is a two-in-one apparatus. It's, uh, the tube is where the, it's used as an egg laying tube, but it also is used for venom injection. Why I'm telling you this is because it's really this anatomical difference between these parasitic wasps and the other wasp, the stinging wasps that I'll be talking about for the most part this evening. So this is a very diverse group, um, very tiny species that are even parasitizing small aphids. So you can get a sense of how small they may be up to very large species such as this giant ichneumon wasp. So for the rest of the presentation, I really wanna focus on the group Aculeata, which includes ants, uh, as well as the stinging wasps. And don't get uh, confused by that common name, stinging wasp, because they do sting, but for different reasons and different purposes, which I'll, I'll talk about. And then as you can see, the uh, stinging wasps are 
uh, closely related to bees. So bees descended or um, stinging wasps are the ancestors of bees. So I'll be drawing on some similarities between the stinging wasps and our beloved bees. So what is a stinging wasp? Well, I mentioned the anatomical difference. Um, the stinging wasps are using their sting or stinger to uh, inject venom into their prey. And instead of using it in, also as an egg laying tube, they are laying their eggs instead from an opening at the end of their abdomen. So it's no longer this two-in-one apparatus. Uh, like the parasitic wasps. So the stinging wasps are out, the females are out hunting for either insects or spiders in the landscape. And that is what they are stinging, carrying back to the nest or dragging back to the nest and feeding their larva this insect or spider prey. Now, um, I wanna talk about the similarities between the stinging wasps and the bees because we all love bees and I'm sure many of you tuning in know a whole lot about bees. Um, you're maybe a bee aficionado, you know a lot about how they nest, so you'll start to really see some similarities through this presentation between the stinging wasps and the bees. So as we know, bees uh, are essentially vegetarian. The female bees have some kind of structure typically on the outside of their body, pollen collecting hairs or pollen baskets where they are actively collecting pollen to carry back to their nest. Uh, combining it with nectar to feed their offspring. So that is a completely plant-based diet that the bees are collecting from flowering plants to feed their larva. Uh, the stinging wasps, on the other hand, are out uh, hunting for insects or spiders. They are capturing their insects or spiders, uh, carrying them back the nest, and then stuffing them inside of the nest to feed their larva. But where pollination comes in with the stinging wasps is be, as adults, the, the wasps are primarily looking for sugary substances and that can include flower nectar. So if you're a pollinator watcher, I'm sure you've seen various kinds of wasps visiting the native flowering plants in your garden and they are seeking out the nutrients, the, the, primarily the nectar from flowers. So similarities between bees and wasps. Here's a couple of images just to uh, hone in on some of the uh, similarities with cavity nesting bees and wasps. So here we have a larva that I'm pointing out on both uh, images. The top image is an or orchard mason bee larva nest. And the orchard mason bee uh, uses mud to partition to make partitions and also line the nest. Um, and similarly, the bottom nest is of a mason wasp and the mason wasp also use mud to partition and line their nest. The larvae are busy feeding on the provisions that the mother has provided. In the case of the bee, uh, that combination of pollen and nectar. And in the case of the solitary mason wasp, uh, a number of caterpillars have been stuck, stuffed inside of the brood cell to feed the larva. And as I mentioned earlier, just happens to have some similarities with the nesting uh, materials. Both these species use mud. And you can see that slight curvature of the mud partition. So the mother wasp or bee is even providing tactile cues to help um, either the wasp or the bee when they uh, turn into an adult, um, help them orient and get out, out of the cavity nest in the, in the right direction. So if we look at the similarities with some of the solitary ground nesting bees and solitary ground nesting wasps, that beautiful mining bee, a, a willow specialist, she likes to nest in loose sand and she's got her pollen collecting structures just chock full of pollen. She uh, lands on the ground, reopens her nest burrow entrance in loose sand, uh, dives inside and then will offload all of that pollen into a prepared brood cell. And similarly, the solitary wasp on the bottom image also likes to nest in loose sand. Uh, the females hunt flies, so that female has captured a type of flower or surfid fly, and she's reopening her nest burrow and dragging the fly inside. So just that difference between stocking the nest with pollen and nectar versus stocking the nest with some kind of insect or spider. 
So if we break down the uh, stinging wasps a little bit further, uh, the social wasps make up approximately one and a half percent of the total number of species. So that's a very uh, small minority of wasps that are social. So keep that in mind when we talk about stinging a little bit later. And I'll touch on the social wasps to start with. Um, any wasp nest constructed of paper is going to be a social wasp nest. Uh, like the solitary stinging wasp, the social wasps also have a modified ovipositor. Um, instead of using that sting to sting their prey, social wasps are actually uh, stinging us or other threats to the nest. So stinging is used to defend the nest. So instead of stinging the prey, the females will actually just jump on it, capture it, and then quickly sub subdue it by literally chewing it up. So that image on the slide is of a female paper wasp and clasped in her mandibles was a former uh, caterpillar that she caught, uh, quickly chewed up, and then she will carry that sort of mushy mess uh, back to her nest. It'll get divided up into pieces when she's intercepted at the nest entrance and then fed to the various larvae developing within the social nest. So social wasps, you can think of as we have three primary genera, native genera that are in Eastern North America. I know some of you are tuning in from the West, but um, I apologize, but the presentation primarily focuses on Eastern US species. Uh, so we have paper wasps, and then we have a group of uh, social wasps called yellow jackets, which include two genera, uh, Vespula and De Delico Vespula. We do have some introduced social wasp species, uh, uh, for example, the Vespa genus, um, but they are not native to North America. So the paper wasps, uh, their nests are very distinct. Um, they typically, or they usually only build one nest comb, and it's a, usually attached to some kind of horizontal uh, surface or structure. In the photo in the bottom left, that's a overhanging rock in more urban or places where we live. Uh, they often like to build their nest on our house soffits. The other really distinctive thing about their nest is it, the nest does not have a paper or nest envelope. So it's just this exposed comb that is continuously expanded throughout the growing season. The uh, yellow jacket wasps in the genus Vespula typically will build a nest at ground level or below ground. So this is often the group of insects or the genus that we have the most uh, negative interactions with. We maybe are mowing our lawn or we're out for a hike and we accidentally step on a ground nesting yellow jacket nest. So the nest, once it becomes social and has multiple occupants, um, there will be nest guards at the nest entrance and they will alert other nest mates if there's any kind of threat to the nest. So that's usually when a stinging occurrence uh, happens. Um, the Delico Vespula genus for the most part are usually, other than in really cold northern climates, are usually building their nest above ground, often attached to a tree branch. Um, the bald-faced hornet, which is, is a yellow jacket, but it unfortunately is confusing because it has a hornet in its common name. Um, they're usually building their nests anywhere from 15 to 20 feet above the ground. So we have sort of fewer uh, negative interactions with the aerial yellow jackets, simply because their nests are high enough off the ground usually <laughs> that we can safely walk back and forth underneath without um, getting stung or the nest being defended. So to build this paper nest, just imagine you're a female wasp. You have to, uh, if you're establishing the nest in the queen, you're either a new queen or a nest foundress. Uh, you need to not only find a place to nest, but you need to do a whole lot of work to collect uh, fiber to make paper. And various sort of sources are often sought out such as dry grass stalks. Um, if sometimes I have a cedar picket fence, so I'll often find social wasps busy chewing the wood fibers from the exposed cedar pickets. Uh, similarly, the particularly the Delico vespula, the ones that nest above ground are seeking 
uh, very dry dead wood, and that's what makes their gray nest paper uh, combs and nest envelope. The vespula that are nesting below ground will often source sort of more rotting wood. So if you were to uh, look at their nest once it's not occupied, you would find that the the nest paper is more yellow in color. So the that middle top middle image is of a, a tree where the inner bark is exposed and you can see those linear strips that the wasps have been chewing in order to collect, collect the wood fiber. So as the females are chewing, they're combining either water or mandibular secretions with that fiber to make it moist. They continuously kind of work it and um, continue to chew it up till it turns into a paper-like material. And then they are using that to build not only the, the cells inside of the comb, but if they're nesting above ground, for example, the Delico Vespula, they're doing a whole lot of work to make layers and layers of a beautiful uh, nest envelope to provide that some protection to the nest from uh, hot and cool temperatures. Now the paper wasps have a little bit different life cycle than the uh, yellow jackets. Uh, what's unusual about them or different is that the nest is often established by one, usually more, more than one female, um, and they're usually sisters. And what, why that happens is they, uh, the new females who are uh, next year's queens overwinter in groupings. So they often emerge in the spring at the same time. Um, one will start a nest and then the sister may join it. So there's often two females working cooperatively uh, to start the nest. If you're familiar with the bumblebee life cycle or if you tuned into my bumblebee presentation for wild ones, um, the social wasps have a very similar life cycle where the nest is established in the spring by an overwintering female. They start producing female offspring first or the workers uh, followed by males and then new females that will be next year's queens. Uh, paper wasps primarily hunt caterpillars, so they have been found or documented to be very beneficial in certain situations, hunting uh, caterpillars such as tobacco hornworm larva, um, cabbage looper moss, fall webworm, because they are, are focusing on, in on hunting just caterpillars. The yellow jackets have a very similar life cycle, except the nest is established by one female, overwintering female. And that female uh, spends the winter by herself. So if I'm doing restoration work in woodlands, particularly this time of year, and if I bump a log that's lying on the ground, I will often find, a, 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 for example, a bald-faced hornet that has tucked herself under a rotting log to spend the winter. The difference in the prey that the yellow jackets seek out um, the Delico Vespula, the ones that nest above ground, typically only hunt live insect prey. They can hunt a, a real variety of prey, uh, anything that they can capture. But the yellow jackets, the ones that typically nest below ground, uh, will often scavenge. So you'll find them uh, eating dead insects, scavenging for protein on dead animals or dead birds and they really like sugary substances in late summer. So the yellow jackets are attracted to our soda, um, our uh, fruit, uh, fruit that maybe has fallen under a crab apple tree, for example. So they're really seeking out a, lot, a wider variety of food sources as, adult, as adults, and as well as bringing back those food sources to the nest. All right, the solitary wasps by far are my favorite group out of the stinging wasps because they have so many similarities to bees. And I, of course, absolutely love bees, but uh, after studying the solitary wasps, I find them even more fascinating in some cases. So they, they too have this modified ovipositor. So they're just using their stinger to sting their prey. And why they're doing that is because the female has to carry or drag the prey back to the nest. So the sting actually results in either full or partial paralysis of the prey. The female may sting, them, the, sting the prey multiple times. And then that makes it a whole lot easier for the female to carry that prey back to her nest. So that picture in, on this slide is of a sand wasp. She's clutching a type of plant bug underneath her that is 
fully alive, but immobile or paralyzed because she has stung the prey. So paralyzed prey has a number of advantages. That prey can remain alive for up to a week. And that means it's this really fresh food source for the larva to consume after it's stocked inside of a brood cell. And um, it also sort of limits injury to the larva. So you can see those big caterpillars in the image and the little tiny larva and uh, it, there's no risk of the larva getting injured while it's busy consuming the caterpillars because they're, they're paralyzed. Um, so the number of caterpillars or whatever type of prey that the wasp may be carrying or, and bringing back to the nest uh, and stalking in, inside of an individual cell will really vary based on the type of prey that the wasp hunts um, and then the seasonality. So you can imagine earlier in the spring, caterpillars are in their uh, earlier instar stages, much smaller in size. So a female hunting caterpillars may stock more in a brood cell at the beginning of the growing season. Later in the growing season, when the caterpillars are larger, um, she may not need as many caterpillars to fill up that uh, individual brood cell. So solitary wasp habitat is very, very similar, of course, to bee habitat. And I just want you to think of sort of on a broader scale for the next few slides, but then we can scale that down, back down into the maybe individual garden size plantings that we are managing. So wasps, of course, need flowering plants, but they also need other sugary substances in some cases. Um, that can include uh, sap flows from different plants, early spring sap flows from maples and birches, but they also really like to feed on honeydew, and honeydew is the waste of plant feeding insects such as aphids. So if you see a wasp uh, very attracted to a plant but is not visiting the flowers and is instead perching on the leaves below, uh, it may be feeding on the honeydew that has dropped on the leaves because aphids are on the plant somewhere. Uh, like bees, some wasps have very specific soil types that they want to nest in. Uh, they have very specific nesting preferences based on where they nest, either above or below ground. And they also need to be very close to the type of prey that they're hunting. So other than the social wasp that can have a little bit broader or more generalist uh, diet or what they're hunting to feed their offspring, most of the solitary wasps have very specific prey. So you can imagine how that would really tie them into um, a certain habitat. So here's an example. This is a relatively uncommon type of uh, mason wasp in the genus Leptochylus. Uh, this species likes to nest in pithy stems such as Thing, plants such as uh, sumac or elderberry, sort of, sort of our softer wooded native plants that are early successional. Uh, and this wasp hunts uh, beetles and weevils. So those are typically found in deciduous trees. And in addition to finding, being nesting close to prey sources so that she can uh, successfully stock her nest with prey, she also needs to be in close proximity to flowering plants to fuel those activities. So if we, if this was a bee, we, we would be eliminating the prey uh, circle and really bees need uh, adequate nesting sites and an adequate supply of flowering plants. But with wasps, they also need to be in close proximity to their specific prey. And this is what's really fascinating about solitary wasps is uh, many of them have very specific prey. Prey specificity can range from perhaps multiple families, and then it can get quite narrow, uh, one genus. So that acorn weevil wasp on the left part of the slide uh, only hunts uh, weevils in the genus Curculio, and they typically bore into acorns. So this wasp needs to nest in compacted sand near where oak trees are growing, where acorns are produced and the prey uh, may be available. And then it also needs to have flowering plants within that habitat in order to fuel its activities. Uh, similarly, another example, we have wasps called bee wolves. And as you can imagine, they are hunting bees for the most part. Sometimes they will also hunt wasps. 
And uh, the bee wolf that I have pictured on this slide hunts bees belonging to the, the sweat bee family, Helictidae. So that female, female wasp has a paralyzed uh, small sweat bee tucked underneath her as she's about to uh, reopen her nest and go inside to stalk the bee. So on a landscape context, this is sort of the crazy, if you want to call it that, uh, or the importance of wasps. So if we were to remove wasps from uh, this landscape context, uh, we would really have a number of insect populations that would go way out of balance because wasps are hunting not only leaf, seed, uh, uh, eating insects, they are hunting sometimes uh, insects that pollinate flowering plants, and in addition, spiders. But we can't live without wasps, is my message. Uh, they really do play an important role in keeping ecosystems and plant communities, uh, insect populations in balance. And this is what another really cool thing about prey specificity. This illustration is no exaggeration. This is a sort of compacted sand footpath uh, that people walk in in a park near, near about a mile where, from where I live. And I've been documenting the various um, sand nesting species in this little strip and all the ones featured on this slide, in addition to probably about 17 different bee species, <laughs> all nesting within the same spot. And why, do they, why can they do that? Um, because each of these wasps is hunting a completely different kind of insect. So there is no competition for the food that they are looking for to feed their offspring. So they, they are more than happy to share this really um, confined nesting situation and live together <laughs> amicably. Now, solitary wasps like our native bees, uh, the vast majority uh, nest in the ground. And like solitary native bees, you can have them uh, nests occurring in your yard without any stinging occurrence likely to happen. Um, the female, like a native bee, the solitary wasp female is doing all that nest excavation. Often the solitary wasp nests will look a little bit different. Many of them, if you look at that bottom right image, the females will make a lopsided tumulus. The tumulus is the term for the soil mounded around the nest entrance. And um, so they will push all of that soil as they excavate out to one side. Uh, native bees usually are piling the soil sort of like that top uh, left image around the nest entrance. Um, but nests can really vary in, in architecture, in size, in the length that they're being actively provisioned. Um, some nests will only have one cell and then they're closed up and then the wasp species will start excavating a second nest right nearby. Others are like bee nests where the female is excavating multiple cells within the nest. So she's busy working on that nest for several weeks while she's capturing prey and bringing them back to the nest. So here's an example of a common wasp species that many people recognize, uh, partly because it's brightly colored and fairly large, the great golden digger wasp. This is a ground nesting species. You can see from the illustration from the, this 1985 study that the wasp, the nest architecture is similar to bees. So the females excavating that main burrow with um, various lateral uh, brood cells that radiate off from the main burrow. And then within those uh, cells, she's stocking each with either two to six true crickets or katydids. So talking about prey transport, you can see that, that the prey in this situation uh, is often much larger than the female. So it's a real struggle for her to um, successfully fly that prey back to the nest. So she may do so in short spurts or end up dragging the prey across the, uh, across the ground near the end to get it back to her uh, nest burrow. Uh, I'm gonna play a short video and hopefully it works for everyone. So hopefully that played or wasn't too stuttery for you tuning in, but what if you could hear what the great golden digger wasp female was doing 
um, you, could, you should have been able to hear sort of a buzzing sound. And wasps in this family, Specidae, will use a similar mechanism that bees use to sonicate or buzz pollinate flowers. So what she was actually doing in this video was grasping hold of clumps of dirt while she's trying to excavate and then vibrating the muscles in the back of her thorax, her flight muscles, and this radiates into her head and her mandibles. So she's literally sort of jackhammering the soil as she tries to, to dig. Um, so there's a number of types of um, this mechanism that is used by this family. I'll talk about one another way that they use this mechanism a little bit later, but just another fun example of, or of how these solitary wasps are similar to bees. All right, here's an example of a wasp that just builds one uh, nest cell. And this is the wasp that I showed at the beginning that likes to nest in loose sand, the American sand wasp. Uh, the females are just absolutely hilarious to watch. They are very vigorous diggers. <laughs> they will quickly dig their nest and fling soil really quickly. Um, and they have these long rakes on their forelegs. I've sort of um, enlarged the photo of the foreleg of the female. You can see the long spines. And that's really her digging tools where she bends her forearms and um, digs quickly to uh, get all of that loose sand out to dig her nest burrow. What's unusual about this wasp besides building a nest with just one cell is the cell is progressively provisioned. Most solitary wasps mass provision their nest, meaning they, they hunt the prey and put a certain number inside of the cell, uh, lay an egg and then close it up. Uh, this wasp will um, dig a burrow, hunt one prey, put it inside, lay an egg, leave the nest open, and then check on the nest every once in a while to see if the larva needs more prey and then continuously bring the larva more prey as it develops. So that's quite unusual because that means that the female, the mother is having um, some interaction with the larva, which typically wouldn't occur with a mass provision nest. All right, here's another example of a ground nester. Um, the Eastern Cicada Killer wasp is the largest wasp that occurs in Eastern North America. Um, beautiful wasp, but often really scares people because of its size. Uh, the female, because she hunts, exclusively hunts cicadas, and you know how big cicadas are, um, she has to excavate this enormous nest burrow. That picture on the bottom right I took this summer, and those burrows and that mound of soil looks literally looks like a rodent has, has excavated that hole in the ground because the burrow entrance is so large and the mound of soil is so big. But she has to make it oversized just so that she can fit the one or two cicadas that she's stuffing inside each brood cell that she has inside of her nest. All right, solitary wasps like bees nest above ground, often in pre-existing cavities. Uh, there are very few examples where a solitary wasp would do a lot of excavation in wood, for example, or chew out their own nesting cavity. They're really looking, seeking out similar opportunities as bees. So hollow plant stems, um, bramble canes that have been browsed by deer over the winter that provides an opportunistic opening. As I mentioned in that example earlier, uh, pithy woody plants such as sumac and elderberry will be used. And um, the solitary above ground nests usually have multiple cells just based on the architecture or length of the cavity. Uh, this is an, again, a picture of the mason wasp nest and showing the larva consuming the various caterpillars stocked inside of the brood cell. And then later on in the development, the wasp has pupated and um, uh, just starting to get some uh, final coloration in the integument and then will be emerging from the nest as an adult. So solitary wasps above ground. So thinking about how we can provide the, these various types of wasp nesting habitat in our gardens. Logs lying on the ground not only provide nesting opportunities for some of our native bees, particularly again in the Eastern US, but they also will provide opportunities for several species of solitary wasps. So they may be seeking out 
a log that is softer and starting to rot but not wet and chew out the wood fiber to make a nesting cavity inside. And similarly, a standing dead tree provides a number of opportunities. Holes created by beetle larvae that are no longer occupied will, be, will attract a number of solitary wasps as nesting cavities. And then we have wasps that nest above ground that do all of the extra work of making a freeform nest, usually out of mud. So this is a species of potter wasp in the genus Eumenes. And they make these really amazing sort of jug shaped nests. The picture in the upper left, the female is putting the finishing touches on that flared lip. It's, you can see the mud is still wet. Uh, the upper right image, she's inserting her abdomen inside of the opening. And what she's doing is she's laying her egg attached to the roof of the jug, suspended by a silken thread. And the jug at this point is still empty. And now she's going to go out and hunt caterpillars, uh, stuff the caterpillars inside of the opening, fill up the jug, uh, and then close it off, seal it off with mud. If you live sort of in the mid-Atlantic Southeast, it's very common to find uh, multiple uh, of these nests attached to plant stems, sometimes buildings. But for some reason in the northern latitudes where I are, I often only find like single nests um, and not in uh, groupings or aggregations. So after that wasp uh, egg, that egg hanging from the silken thread uh, hatches, the larva then just drops down onto this big pile of paralyzed caterpillars and begins feeding. Uh, we have uh, so wasps that are building these freeform mud nests, but also using mud as uh, the material to partition their nests have to seek out uh, both soil and water to make mud. So the mason wasps, a large sub um, genus Eumenonae, uh, they're sort of they're related to the the social wasps. They uh, the feet you'll find the females perched on the ground, gathering up dry clumps of soil, uh, regurgitating water that they have stored in their crop to moisten that clump of soil and then carry that clump back off to their nest to either make their freeform mud nests like the previous slide, the potter wasp, or to make those mud partitions or to seal off the nesting cavity. We, this is the other example of uh, how that sonication or buzz pollination mechanism is used. So this is the black and yellow mud dauber wasp if you live uh, near a creek or where there's uh, moist soil, you'll find some people will find many females kind of lined up along the edge of a creek. And they actually will use that buzzing mechanism as they gather clumps of wet mud. So they sort of forego that two step process of collecting water first and then soil to make mud. Um, they just simply seek out moist uh, muddy sites in order to collect big clumps of soil. This wasp hunts uh, spiders. So you'll see them looking around um, sheds and other sort of outbuildings seeking out um, various kinds of spiders to capture. And then we have uh, wasps that also sort of are nesting above ground, but not in what we call typical cavities. So some are also making pseudo freeform mud nests. The, the Walden's mason wasp really likes uh, crevices in rocks. So you'll find them sort of forming mud cylinders attached to even concrete. And similarly, the crevice mason wasp likes um, very urban areas. Wherever there's chunks of concrete, you'll find this wasp. Uh, this, these two photos on the right I, are, I captured in my neighbor's sidewalk, the female was busy provisioning a hole in, 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 her, in the neighbor's sidewalk. All right, so wasps uh, really need flowering plants, the ones that I've been talking about this evening, and that's where our landscaping with native plants comes into play. We are not only providing nutrients for native bees, but um, to help fuel all of these prey hunting and nest building activities of many solitary and social wasps. They're seeking out flower nectar, as in addition to other sort of sugary substances that I mentioned earlier, honeydew, the waste from aphids or scale insects, um, sap from trees, 
the social wasps that capture and literally chew up their prey rather than stinging it would be ingesting some of the blood-like fluid hemolymph of their prey. Some wasps will consume a little bit of pollen, but that's less common. If you're tuning in from the West, you have amazing wasps called pollen wasps that are like bees and they, they provision their nests with pollen. And then the social wasps, as well as some of the solitary wasps really like fruit, like the Eastern cicada killer is uh, particularly attracted to peaches. Uh, you'll find the social yellow jackets really like rotting apples. And as I mentioned earlier, the yellow jackets will also sort of scavenge for dead insects, mammals, uh, and even birds. So flower preferences, wasps uh, for the most part don't have really long tongues like some of our bee species. Uh, bumblebees, for example, have you know, tongues 10 to 14 millimeters in length. So they're able to access uh, native flowering plants that have a complex form. Um, that's not really the case with most of the flower visiting wasps. Their tongues are much shorter, so that starts to limit the types of flowering plants they can visit. And then flower visitation is really going to be tied to the habitat that they need. So whether it's specific soil type or where their prey occurs, um, that will obviously influence the types of flowering plants a wasp may visit. Their ability to even get at the flower nectar will um, be an, an indicator whether they visit the plant or not. If the flowering plant is only offering pollen, an example, for example, would be um, our native flowering roses, which are nectarless. You, you're not typically going to see wasps trying to visit that type of flowering plant because it's not offering nectar. And then really it's that, again, that close proximity to those habitat components that will influence whether or not you see a, a wasp visiting a specific flowering plant. But if we look at simply flower structure, um, the dominant plant families that wasp frequent are the following, the, the carrot family, uh, the aster family, the mint family, and the dogbane and milkweed family, all providing nutritious sources of nectar, easy to access flowers. So those are uh, just an example of what kinds of plants you can plant for wasps. The uh, dotted horseman or spotted bee balm uh, is very likely a wasp pollinated plant. You can see that great black wasp uh, inserting its head into the maroon speckled yellow flowers. And as it does so, uh, pollen gets um, deposited on its thorax. And as it visits a, a flower in the female phase, the pollen get, ad adheres to the receptive stigma. So uh, not that it has been proven by a scientific study yet, but that's very likely a, a wasp pollinated plant. And uh, here's some examples of genera in each of those plant families. I know you may be tuning in from different regions. I did develop uh, eight different regional lists for the book that are free to download for Eastern North America. Um, so the carrot family, one of my favorites is Rattlesnake Master. It's a, a very um, interesting spherical white flower head, uh, highly attractive to wasps. And then of course the aster family, so many plants to choose from. One I really wanna mention is fleabane. People often think fleabane is kind of weedy comes in after a disturbance or the early part of a restoration. It actually is a host plant for many of our specialist bees that need that specific kind of pollen. And it also flowers at a, uh, particularly where I live in the upper Midwest at a, a period of time between that real sort of push of spring flowering plants and summer flowering plants. So um, giving a shout out to fleabane this evening. Uh, mint family, hands down, if you can plant any kind of regionally appropriate species of mountain mint, that will be sure to attract a number of different species of wasps. And the horse mint that I featured earlier is highly attractive. And in addition, any kind of milkweed, so regionally appropriate milkweeds that grow where you live, uh, and I'm sure you have a number of species to choose from will attract a number of different kinds of wasps. I added one more family on here, the Euphorbiaceae. So our, some of our native spurges, we have unfortunately some invasive spurges that seem to be 
equally as attractive to some of the solitary wasps, but if you have native spurges uh, that grow in your area, um, give them a try as well. All right, I wanna just two slides to touch on the other two groups that I had on this slide, cuckoo wasps. Some of you may already be familiar with cuckoo bees, but they're essentially uh, kleptoparasites or food thieves. So the females sneak in the nest of another uh, wasp or bee, lay their egg, and then their larva consume the provisions that are, have been stocked inside of that host's nest. Uh, we have these brilliant emerald green uh, cuckoo wasps in the family Chrysididae, a uh, number of different genera. They either prey on usually solitary wasps, but sometimes bees. So in the case of bees, they're not eating the pollen. The larva is not eating the pollen and nectar. They hang out in the nest and wait for the bee larva to get later into its instar stage. And then they're actually consuming the bee larva, the protein source rather than the, the plant-based food source. Uh, and then we have uh, ground nesting wasps that are cuckoo wasps that prey on ground nesting wasps like bees. I use cuckoo bees and cuckoo wasps to help me find the nests of their hosts. So that's a very handy tool if you know what to look for. And finally, parasitoids. So these are different than the Parasitic wasps, I started the presentation with, um, these still belong to the stinging wasp group because they have that modified ovipositor. And so they don't have a nest similar to the parasitic wasps. The females are out seeking their host. Um, in the case of just this example on this slide, these, these two families, the females are really robustly shaped, have large legs, uh, that they use as digging tools and they dig down below ground to sting and then lay their egg on scarab beetle larva or also white grubs. So you can, if you live in the mid-Atlantic, southeast, these two families are quite common, diverse number of species and genera within each family. And um, they are parasitoids rather than parasitic wasps, but don't have a nest. And I'm going to finish off with that. I'm sorry, I don't have any uh, concluding slides and I hope I didn't go way over time this evening. And I really appreciate you all tuning in to learn a little bit more about some of these amazing and charismatic wasps that share our garden and natural areas with us. Well, thank you very much, Heather. What an awesome presentation. I have some questions for you. I'm gonna to try to go through rapid fire. Okay. And then uh, at the end, we have some concluding slides from Wild Ones. So the first question is, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing when, it, when, it, when you look at the caterpillars and how do they not starve to death when they've been parasitized or stung? <laughs> so the caterpillars just are quite literally frozen in time for about a week <laughs> while they still live, right? So that, that venom that has been injected into them paralyzes them and the tissues uh, change a little bit with that venom, but just keeping in the, them alive long enough for the, the wasp larva to consume them. So you can start to feel a little bit sorry for some of the prey that <laughs> wasps hunt now that you learn more about what happens to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you mentioned fear in a lot of people, uh, you know, growing up with the fear of stinging wasps. Do you have ways to talk about children or any tips about talking with their educators about how living with and protecting and learning from wasps uh, can help dispel some of that fear? Yeah, I think it sort of starts with, with some of the things I covered this evening, you know, talking about not all wasps are equal or the same, have the same lifestyle or behaviors. So it's really um, getting beyond the basics and telling them about the different life cycles and lifestyles, um, propensity to sting or not sting, um, getting children like you would um, observing wasps and bees visiting flowering plants, because when any insects at that floral restaurant or buffet, um, they're not near their nest, so stinging won't occur. So it's started getting over that hump of fear and into um, getting children to start to appreciate the diversity and amazing types of wasps in addition to bees. And I think it really depends on the educator, but um, 
just more information is, is powerful is I guess my just succinct answer to that question, Matthew. <laughs> Perfect, Heather. Uh, can you give us some tips on building habitat? So I know you kind of ended up talking about the cuckoo wasp and what to look for, but what type of things, if we were trying to encourage wasps to overwinter in our gardens or to live in our gardens, uh, what type of elements in terms of a water source or nesting cavities or overwintering tips might you have? Yeah, so overwintering tips, I mentioned social wasps, um, like the yellow jackets, some like to nest under logs lying on the ground. Um, some will tuck themselves under heavy leaf litter or plant debris, so some insulated place. The solitary wasps, like solitary bees, would be um, overwintering in the nest as larva pre-pupa. So they're either going to be below ground or already in some kind of pre-existing cavity plant stem that you have um, provided in your garden. So it's really no different than providing those habitat components that you would for bees. And, in, and you mentioned um, shallow water dishes, that would be important for the mason wasp, for example, that are, are making mud or even paper wasps that need that water to help uh, work the paper that they are creating as their nesting material. Perfect. Now we're at that phase, you have a nest and you're trying to think of a way to ethically and safely manage moving a nest or trying to prevent some of those stinging wasps from coming into your house. What are some of the things that you could do to live in harmony with the, with the wasp yet um, potentially move them out of some high traffic areas? Yeah, it's, so it's really difficult to move um, any kind of bee or wasp nest um, other than maybe a honeybee <laughs> nest that's in a managed hive. Um, so I discouraged that. Um, one thing that my neighbor did this year, she discovered a yellow jacket nest in her garden. Um, she went out in the evening, put a bucket over the nest entrance, which is a ro usually a rodent hole and put a rock on top of, top of the bucket um, so that at, in the evening, like a bee nest, all the wasps are inside of the nest for a social nest. And she successfully um, sort of got rid of the nest because they were unable to get out for a week and essentially starved. So that is a non-chemical -chem way that you could um, get rid of a yellow jacket nest that's right in the middle of your garden, for example. Um, the, the social wasps, the paper nests that are up on your house soffits two stories up or way up in a tree, you wouldn't have to worry as much because um, human activity at the ground 20 feet below usually wouldn't trigger any kind of stinging um, from going on. So you really just have to use your best judgment. Is the nest in a high traffic area? Um, do you have a ground nest right in your garden? Um, try and use non-chemical ways, like I suggested, to um, ex exhaust or get rid of the nest. Um, but also just be observant. I find yellow jacket nests in my garden every year. Um, usually about August, the sunlight will catch the high activity. I'll see yellow jackets firing in and out of the nest. And I just say, okay, I'm going to avoid that spot until... October when it gets cooler because those, all of those nests are annual. That's something to keep in mind. Unless you live in Florida or <laughs> the Gulf Coast, um, anywhere, anywhere else in the Eastern US, those nests are annual. So you, you can also wait it out is what I'm trying to say. That's a great tip. And I, I'm noticing in the chat, a lot of people are saying, we've lived in harmony with wasps forever. Yay. They're great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had another question. You mentioned wasps parasitizing caterpillars, and you mentioned a couple of the ones that are typically viewed as pests in the landscape. Are there uh, thresholds where wasp activity might be deleterious to um, some of our native butterfly caterpillars? And if so, are you noticing any changes in that relationship uh, due to potentially climate change or other uh, factors? Yeah, there, so often I get the question about predation on monarch caterpillars because many people are very tuned into their monarch caterpillar, caterpillar population that they have in their garden. Um, we do have an introduced paper wasp, the European paper wasp. It has bright orange antenna. If you, uh, if you spot one, they're black with yellow markings. 
um, they are really um, a study that was done by a researcher in Kentucky about three years ago demonstrated that they are primarily hunting monarch caterpillars. So it's not um, the native paper wasp species. And that uh, European paper wasp is really uh, opportunistic. It can build nests earlier than our native paper wasps. It can nest in really degraded areas. It has larger nests. And then it's selectively going to some of these uh, important caterpillar species like monarchs. So if you, if you find a European paper wasp nest, that would be one kind of nest I would encourage you to destroy simply because they are sort of doing more harm than good. But if you, again, have a balanced ecosystem, adequate supply of flowering plants, um, you have to think of your garden as an ecosystem. And if you're supporting native insects, then it hopefully should be balanced and you're not, uh, not hundred percent of your monarch caterpillars will be being um, preyed upon by native wasps. So I hope that helps a little bit, but it's really obviously hard to quantify as well. So yeah. True, true. Yeah. Um, I had two last questions for you. One is, do solitary wasps respond to prescribed burns and restored prairie habitats as quickly as ground nesting bees? I'm wondering um, if you need to yeah. go for it. Yeah, they, some of, there are a few studies, but most of the um, prescribed burn and prairie studies have focused on ground nesting bees and burns, um, almost all studies demonstrate that burns do uh, enhance uh, ground nesting habitat because it creates a, a ton of bare areas. Um, some of those ground nesting wasps I featured, if you remember, really are attracted to bare sand. So dunes, um, beaches, blowouts. So that's kind of a, a little bit different habitat than I would think of as uh, our prairie plant communities that are grass dense and need that prescribed burning. But they would maybe move into those areas for a short period of time, but then um, be less likely to nest there continuously because of the um, dense vegetative cover that would happen over time. Perfect. And our last question, I know uh, Dr. Talamy, one of our other honorary directors, often totes oaks as being the, the great uh, supporting plant for caterpillars. And a question came in, does Solidago support more wasps than any other plant genera? And if not, which one does? Well, for the wasp species that I featured in my book, um, Solidago did come in number one um, as the most preferred uh, perennial flowering native plant. Um, some other top uh, genera include Eupatorium, so the bone sets, uh, mountain mints that I mentioned earlier, and milkweeds. Uh, but don't forget about woody species. If, believe it or not, uh, sumac genus is very popular with wasps. Uh, New Jersey tea, I've got my book out in front of me here, <laughs> and uh, lead plant, amorpha, those are all great wasp plants as well. Well, perfect. Well, thank you very much, Heather. This has been absolutely insightful for all of us, and I just wanted to uh, share with our audience that if you're looking to learn more about wild ones and native plants, uh, check out our award-winning quarterly journal that highlights wild ones programs and member-requested articles about native plants. And if you remember, we had a great one about bees following your last talk. Uh, so if you guys are interested in learning more about bees, definitely check out that article. And every time that we have a publication, we have some amazing uh, tidbits of information for all of you. We also list native plant nurseries and resources throughout the journal for your own benefit. Additionally, if you're looking for more learning opportunities from subject matter experts, make sure to register for our upcoming webinars. In November on the 16th, we're welcoming Larry Wiener as he shares with us the self-perpetuating landscape, setting a process in motion webinar. The registration link will be dropped off in the chat. And then I'll be joining you all on January 13th to talk about America's Public Gardens, a resource for native plants. Uh, when registering, uh, re registration will be open. Uh, you'll be notified via email and our social media channels. So please uh, take a chance to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, if you're not already doing so, to learn more about that program and many others. If you are part of or know a youth serving organization, Wild Ones is now accepting applications for the Lori Otto Seeds for Education grant program. The Seeds for Education program awards grants up to $500 for planning, planting, and caring. 
for native plant gardens. And as mentioned, if you don't follow us on social media, please do. Uh, we're on Facebook as Wild Ones Native. We're on Instagram as Wild Ones Native Plants. YouTube, as we mentioned earlier, you'll get a chance to see this recording and many others. We also have LinkedIn and Twitter. With close to 6,000 members and 73 chapters and seedlings across 21 states and the nation, please consider joining the mission and welcoming others to also join with you at members.wildones.org slash join. If there's not a current chapter in your area, please reach out for information on starting a seedling chapter. And we appreciate your feedback on our webinar. So you can find the link in the chat to complete our attendee survey. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you all have a wonderful evening and have been imparted with new wisdom and knowledge about the world of wasps. So thank you again, Heather, and thank you to the team at Wild Ones working behind the scenes to make events like today possible. We hope you have a great night and thank you very much.